and all of a sudden all of the fog and the trees and the mountains and everything started to coalesce into this one enormous pattern that was kind of like a bio-organic pattern that was kind of like a chain link fence, kind of like this, mm -hmm. that all things that we were seeing were a part of. Right. And then at a certain point it all connected and we were no longer on planet Earth. Mm. And for the next, I don't know how long, uh, we were what I've been calling to this day, astral traveling. Everybody. Welcome to the Instrumental Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Shankin. I'm also the director of Mount Tam Psychedelic Integration. We offer psychedelic preparation integration coaching to people all around the world and other educational events as well. And you can see that at tamintegration.com. And if you want to support the podcast, you can, you know, you can hit up Patreon at, at Tam Integration as well. Uh, we're co-produced by Deadhead Land, uh, which is the happiness place on earth uh, that is uh, run by Brian, who is graciously, um, you know, sharing his, his uh, Facebook page with us. And you can support Deadhead Land on their Patreon as well. Um, I don't know if our guest today has a Patreon, although he probably should. Uh, an amazing musician, uh, an amazing teacher. I've had the uh, honor the privilege you know the, the the great benefit of being able to study with him myself and you may know him uh through his various projects with things like rat dog and the dead and um you know very, very many other things uh mark karen welcome to the show hi hi how's you so how you doing this morning i'm all I'm right good. you're up you're up earlier than usual that, that was at your request my friend <laughs> <laughs> Well, I sure do appreciate it. And so, as you know, the you know the theme of the show is how do, does our spiritual path influence our music and our creativity? And in this case, um, maybe more specifically, how does our psychedelic spiritual path influence our music and our creativity? And we're really interested almost in seeing if we can't start from the beginning and almost look at your how do we say it your um the origin story where it all began for you mm. well given the topic um you know i i have the uh semi-enviable experience i guess of having been born uh at a time where uh when i was entering into my adolescence mm -hmm. uh, the hate was in full bloom uh you know, I, in 1967, I was 12 years old and, uh, I had started smoking a little bit of pot the year before, mm -hmm. um, my, my parents, uh, mostly my stepdad, but, uh, both my parents dabbled and they were sort of beatniks on the cusp of hippie. They were a little too young to have been beatniks and maybe a little old to have been right in the middle of the hippie thing. Uh, but my first exposure to pot and then uh, not too long after to LSD came via my own parents' experimentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, being around during that era and, and hanging out in the hate and hanging out in Golden Gate Park and going to the Speedway Meadows, Grateful Dead Jefferson Airplane concerts and all of that stuff. I, what year was that? Um, I, I, I started in 66. I think my first, my, my first Fillmore show was... Uh, was actually a Grateful Dead show at the old Fillmore in 66. I, I think it was even on my birthday. Mm. Uh, my parents used to take me, Graham did this wonderful thing back in the day that I've never seen anybody do since, which was he would take the Friday and Saturday night shows that he'd put on from nine to one, and he would put them on again on Sundays, but they would be in the afternoons, from two in the afternoon till six in the evening. And if you were 12 or under, you got in free. And so my parents pretty frequently would take me to the Fillmore and drop me off at two in the afternoon at age 12, 13, even a little bit at 11. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would go in and I would see the airplane or Quicksilver or the dead. Uh, 
and the, the added bonuses that Graham would sneak in on us of Howlin' Wolf or Albert King or James Cotton, you know, it's mm -hmm. got to a lot of great blues. And so needless to say, I was exposed to that whole sort of psychedelic ex explorational community and sensibility. Um, right. So you my, got, you were, you were going to show shows at like 11 and 12. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. I, I didn't, I mean, I didn't see the dead till I was like 16. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's. I think that's true for a lot of people. I, I yeah. think my situation is pretty unusual, but you know, at, at that time period too, the dead was a very different thing. I mean, I was never, technically, I was never a deadhead. By the time that term got coined, I'd been seeing the dead for years, and I'd had actually moved on to other musics as my primary uh, interests. Um, you know, so I wasn't really part of that phenomenon as much as just you know back then. We were just a bunch of people that happened to like music, and the Grateful Dead was one of the bands that we liked a whole bunch. Right. You know, um, but I, uh, I, I think my first acid was actually somebody. I ran away from home at one point. It was something I did with some frequency back then. <laughs> okay. Um, I would, I would get peeved with my parents or whatever, and uh, we were living down by Half Moon Bay in a little town called Montera. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would head, head out to the highway and stick my thumb out and get up to San Francisco. And uh, and I would immediately go to the hate and hang out there, you know, because there were always people to meet and things to do and whatnot. And this one evening I ran, ran or this one day I ran away from home and I wound up uh, selling acid for this girl named Susie Cream Cheese on Hate Street. And uh, and I got turned on to a hit of uh, Owsley White Lightning. And that was my first LSD. Um, and oddly, it wasn't all that strong. And, you know, in the early days, our LSD experiences, my, my experiences with my little group of friends were very explorational, but also kind of fearful, very cautious. Mm -hmm. uh, we would take, you know, we'd heard about these amazing big trips that came with acid and we were a little scared of it. We were intrigued by it, but a little scared of it. And so we would take little quarter hits and think that we were having the LSD experience. And we kind oh, of you were, were. You were like microdosing. Yeah, we were basically, you know, we, we would get that uplifted sensibility, you know, sort of a, a, a happier take on life, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd giggle easily. Our thought process would become more interesting and absurd. Uh, occasionally it would sort of sit on that cusp where maybe you'd see the walls breathe a little bit, or maybe you'd see little bits of trails coming off your fingers, but not really any visuals and nothing, and nothing really like mind bogglingly revelatory. Right. Um, but then, uh, one day we heard, t we had taken something called blue flat and we'd gone out for a big hike and we'd had a wonderful, wonderful acid trip for the day. And we got back and it was late afternoon. And we could feel that we were coming down and we didn't want to. So we decided to try something we'd never tried before. As it was, we'd take, we'd gotten to the point where we were taking whole hits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we started out the day with a full hit of blue flat, but later that afternoon, uh, we decided we didn't want to come down. And we'd been told that if you already were on, you needed to double down if you were going to do it again or keep going or whatever. So we each took another two hits of blue flat and went out for a walk and it was dusk and you know how the colors get all cool at dusk and twilight mm -hmm. you know, and everything the indirect light makes everything crisper and more detailed and more interesting and we were out for a walk we started noticing we're looking around at all this stuff and i started commenting that everything that we were seeing looked exaggerated 3d but kind of flat like one of those old view masters you know the things with the little clicky doos that had the 3d images in them sure you know stuff that started looking like that and then we sort of we got off the beaten path and went into this little grove and i looked at my buddy paul whose shirt was open down to his waist and i saw this green light kind of glowing and i looked closer and i could see his skin kind of going translucent and all these little patterns that seemed like capillaries or whatever the fuck and this this glow and this sort of sense of organs, not really seeing organs, but sensing organs within his body. And his brother Tim was with me and he started seeing the same thing. And we were tripping on that. And then we just kind of walked on. And at one point we sat down 
this kid came riding by on a bicycle like total Tom Sawyer type, you know, might as well have had the, the straw hanging out of his mouth, you know, kind of chewing his cud. And he, he stopped by us and he goes, you know, I've never been here before in a long time. <laughs> We're like, what? what? What did he just say? I've never been here before in a long time. Huh? And we, he kind of rode on and we were looking out at the scene. And all of a sudden, all of the fog and the trees and the mountains and everything started to coalesce into this one enormous pattern that was kind of like a bio organic pattern that was kind of like a chain link fence, kind of like this, mm -hmm. that all things that we were seeing were a part of. Right. And then at a certain point it all connected and we were no longer on planet earth. Mm. And for the next, I don't know how long, uh, we were what I've been calling to this day, astral traveling. Right. Um, I still believe that that's true. Uh, and we had this, what we, what we later dubbed a huge, we called those experiences having a huge. Sure. And, uh, and we used to go up, we, we would get LSD, uh, in quantity, you know, we'd buy like 50 hits or something. And then we would take one to see what the strength was. And then determine from that experiment how we would dose ourselves to create a huge. Right. And that got to be a relatively common experience for us was, you know, like, let's get out there, you know. And we would take smaller doses and go to concerts or, you know, just have fun in the park or whatever, too. But a big part of our psychedelic experience began to be this, this excursion. Right. Now, um, what did you like about being out there when you say we wanted to go out there? What, what was there and what did you like? I was young enough at the time, I think, and innocent enough that I didn't have any fear, really. Right. Um, which, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go on to, to, to share that that didn't stay the case. But um, at that time, everything was really free. And, uh, and, and I was really, really curious. Um, and so, you know, what, what we liked about it, what I liked about it anyway, was that it was something completely different than anything else that I'd ever experienced or thought about experiencing yeah. or even imagined might exist. Um, and it, and I, I had grown up in a family that didn't have a lot of spirituality. We certainly had no religion of any kind. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really grown up with a sense of anything other than reality being what I can see and touch and taste and feel on this plane. And a sense that when I died, that was it. You know, if I went on in any way, it would be because my nutrients might help a tree grow. Right. Uh, and that was the extent of my spiritual connection and my sense of how big the universe was. So one of the things that I dug about it was it was expanding my sense of what was real mm -hmm. and what was possible. Um, Which what makes me want to ask what is real? What were the realities that you discovered? What was well, possible? I think, I think for me, what it really became, and this is where fear came in later, is a, a real strong sense that we're creating our own reality or we are, mm -hmm. you know, whatever we, whatever that is, I don't know how to define what a we is or what an I is. Yeah. Uh, but whatever that thing is, um, is creating its own reality. You know, um, so, well, hmm. Were you playing, are you, are, are you looking for a thought? Are you trying to figure out what's real? No, not so much what's real. Um, <laughs> I think that's a, that's a lifelong uh, uh, question, you know, that we probably will spend a lot of time asking ourselves and others. Uh, no, I was, um, I, I can be a little scattered sometimes. A, a couple of thoughts that just came to me were like, one of the reality things that I experienced was considerably later. Um, and what I dub as my first bad trip, actually, right. uh, where I was at a friend's house with several other friends and we were all taking orange sunshine, which was a particularly strong strain that, uh, or strain, um, version of acid that went around for a while. Uh, and, uh, the, the downside was that our friend's parents were home. So, you know, we spent most of the night. We, we, we dropped at night, 
which can be weird too, you know, because the darkness really sort of enhances what you're going to see because there's a lot more left to the imagination. Uh, so we dropped at night and we did it outside, but, but you know, it got super late and cold and everything. We, went, we eventually wound up going inside where we had to maintain. And one of the things that I learned about being on strong psychedelics is it's not such a groovy experience if you can't let them take you where they want to take you. Mm -hmm. uh, if you try to fight it, if you try to hold on to your version of reality and what you think is happening, uh, at least for me, I can't speak for other people, but for me, that became a bad place to be because the acid was essentially taking me to a place that was bigger than me and stronger than me. And I was trying to fight it. And that was not a good thing. So that, uh, that trip, <clears throat> some weird shit happened and we all kind of did the astral traveling thing, but for the first time ever, it kind of had a negative flavor to it. It was kind of driven by fear and had some of the visions and some of the experiences that I was creating mm -hmm. um, were really scary. Uh, people that I loved were against me and stuff like that. Yeah. And then as I was coming down, um, we were all in the, in the room adjacent to the kitchen all the fellas, this is so patriarchal and whatever, you know, this, the times, you know, back then, you know, us hippies all referred to our girlfriends as old ladies too. And I don't know what the hell that was about, but anyway, all the girls were in the because kitchen. Because you guys wanted to like pretend you were bluesmen or something. I, we wanted to pretend we were Neil Young and those people were already calling their, their girlfriends that stuff. And I think right. we, were just, we were just echoing our heroes at that sure, point, sure. The, the older hippies, because we were young hippies. Um, but uh, as I was coming down, the girls were all in the kitchen and they were making breakfast. Mm -hmm. And I started having this really weird experience. There used to be these things. I, I don't know what they're called. But they're kind of similar to the old rotoscopes they used to use to edit film. And there were these like, they were like lights and they had little um, plates in them. And each plate was a slightly different picture. And it would turn and, and, and you'd, you'd spin see. it and you'd look in the hole. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're called zoetropes, aren't they? That sounds right. I think that might be that. Yeah. There's, there's the restaurant in North beach that's named after it. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, well, and there was a, there's a film company too, American zoetrope or something like that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, I started experiencing reality kind of like that. Mm -hmm. So I was experiencing the gals in the kitchen next to me and it would go from, they were all little elfin creatures in these in these cute little fluffy outfits, and they were making really perfect, wonderful, loving, happy breakfasts for us. And sure, and that, and that felt really good. And then it would shift, and the very next one, they would be like little goblin girls, and they'd be <laughs> spitting in the food. And my girlfriend would say, "This one's for Mark," <laughs> you know, and, and just really horrible, you know. And and it kept shifting. The realities kept shifting. And my experience, and I had a big fear about this, I, I, I realized, was that I was being invited to pick a reality to come back to. Right. And I didn't know which one to pick or how to pick. That's the thing. It's when I'm hearing that. It's like when you choose your reality, it seems like it's almost like a function of the state of your heart. You know, it's like how, what can you do? As far as being this, it's not like a mental choice. It's like a quality of being chooses your reality. That's just for me. I think that's true. Although I don't know that we, you know, unless and until we've had a certain amount of practice and experience, I don't know that we, most of us have the ability to right. change where our hearts and, and spirits are at in a given moment. And like, for example, for myself, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've had... Uh, some difficulty in my in my youth uh sure. and uh, and it's created you know what they refer to as complex ptsd and it led to me being alcoholic and all sorts of other stuff right. um and uh so you know i i have that stuff at my core i have a lot of fear i have a lot of anger and stuff that needs to be worked through uh yeah. and that's you know that's my i feel like that's kind of my life's mission at this point is to work with that stuff and heal that stuff and that's kind of why i'm here way more than whether or not i'm here to play guitar or you know all the stuff that i sort of just do on a daily basis i'm here to take this creature that's mark and and uh 
spend time with that creature and 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 experience that creature and heal that creature to the best of my ability you know right and so i want to talk about that there's it's very rich and there's so much there to talk about from so many different angles um how does the music however help you do that if at all well the reality for me and you know sometimes i think this is sad and, and at other times i think it's really beautiful that i have this gift mm -hmm. um is that uh the music is kind of, it's, it's one of, I was going to say it's the only place, but you know, that's not true. There are exceptions and, and, and occasional other places, but it's mostly the only place where I feel me and I feel unthreatened. I don't feel like I have to impress. Well, sometimes I can get hung up in the ego game of it, you know, but but when I'm in the place that I want to be musically, I don't feel like I need to impress or whatever. I feel really connected to the flow of my spirit mm -hmm. and comfortable in my skin and connected to joy. And I'm not worried that I'm being judged. I'm not busy taking other people's inventory and, and seeing where they don't line up with my expectations of them or whatever. I'm not playing the human game. You know, I'm, right. I'm really in myself. And I love that. And actually, I would share that uh, I haven't taken acid and played in a long, long, long time, but I did used to, and it was pretty special. Mm -hmm. And what I can say is, you know, I, I did 16 years completely clean and sober via AA. And back in 2000, I, I uh, switched uh, seats uh, to what I laughingly and lovingly refer to as the marijuana maintenance program sure and you're not the only one who refers to that or yes exactly exactly um and uh and i started smoking pot and on rare occasions with rat dog we would take you know micro doses small small amounts of uh, chocolate mushrooms right and what i will say about that is that uh when i'm playing music and i use psychoactive substances it really enhances the experience. It changes, mm. uh, you know, I don't want to recommend to anybody that they use because I don't know what people's particular demons may or may not be. And I don't want to suggest if somebody's sober that, that they play around or whatever. But for me personally, um, when I get high, even if it's just a puff or two of pot, uh, something changes in the way that I relate to the music, I think what happens is it allows me to get out of my own way. I think what happens is it puts me more in touch with my flow and shuts my editor and my judge and critic, my internal editor and judge and critic, it shuts them up a bit and lets me just do my thing. And there's kind of no time when I feel freer or happier mm -hmm. than when I'm in the flow playing music with people. I mean, it's one of the, it's one of the things I really loved about both Rat Dog and my old band, Jemima Puddle Duck. Was oh, right, that, Jemima Puddle Duck. Um, the, the, the level of communication between the musicians, the level of joy that was expressed, mm -hmm. the, the depth and quality of creativity that we found was just so rewarding to me. I mean, there's kind of, that's what I live for. Those moments is what I live for and why I'm doing all the work that I'm doing on myself now around meditation and 12 step work and all the other stuff that I'm doing, I think is really uh, my experiences around music and around psychotropic, psychoactive, I'm not sure, uh, substances it has given me some kind of an idea of what's possible. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I feel like all the work that I do on myself these days is some attempt to figure out if I can get to those places that I access with those substances right. without the substances. Yeah, isn't that just like the great alchemical work somehow? Well, <clears throat> well I do believe it's possible. Right. You know, I remember the story in Ram Dass's book, Be Here Now, where he talks um, about bringing, I, I don't remember how much it was, but it was some ridiculously large amount of LSD to Neem Karoli Baba. Mm -hmm. And uh, and 
offered it up to me in Kuroli Baba, who proceeded to take, again, I don't remember how much, but some obscene amount that would have like mm -hmm. destroyed any one of us and waited a while and then waited a while and then waited a while and then asked Ram Dass, is something supposed to happen? <laughs> and I guess my, my, the way I walked away from that was sensing that he was already there. Yeah. So the, the pills weren't going to do anything to him because he was already there. Right. I think later that day he said, oh, yeah, that's, um, you know, that's good to give you a glimpse or something like that. Well, and that's kind of always the way I've looked at psychedelics. Yeah. I mean, between Ramdas and Leary, I have a lot of respect for both of them. But the, but the reason I was always more connected to Ram Das was because, to me, Leary made the drug the god. Right. And Ram Das took it as a hint or a window and went on the search. Right. Did you see the, the movie they released a couple of years ago, Dying to Know, I believe? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And their conversations to me were really, really interesting because, you know, nobody can question whether or not Leary was a genius, right? He was, he was absolutely a genius, but there was some sort of wall that he was hitting perhaps like in his chakras or something like, like it was like, you know, kind of just below the crown or just below the heart or something like that, because, you know, you could see that Ram Dass was connected to the source, you know, I was like, that's what I was seeing. I was seeing a guy who was connected to the source, having a conversation with a guy who wanted to kind of philosophize about it or yeah. intellectualize it. Yeah. And, and, and who felt that he needed a substance to get there. Right. I mean, uh, I, Ruth Allison says that according to Ruth Allison, Ram Dass gave Maharaji 900 micrograms. That's a pretty hefty dose. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing street doses these days are around 100. Yeah, and I know back when I was a kid, I think the street doses were somewhere around two fifty or three, and they were. Mm -hmm. That was you know, if you took a whole hit, that was a healthy hit. So nine hundred mics would be a lot. You know, for a, well, for an old man in a different culture who had never done it before. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, I think that I heard that Ramdas started to doubt. He was like, maybe he palmed it, <laughs> and, and he had that thought. And then a couple of days later. Um, Maharaji called him back and said, Ramdas, you gave me the medicine, right? Ramdas says, Yes, Maharaji. He goes, Did I take it? I think so, Maharaji. Are you not sure if I took it? He's like, I'm I'm not sure, Maharaji. He's like, give me again. And this time he took the three and he like made a whole show of it of like. And so, you know, it was obvious that he had swallowed it. And then about 45 minutes later, he started to moan and wail. And he put his head under the blanket, was like rolling around. And then after doing that for a couple of minutes, he pulled it back. He was like, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, until like Ram Dass was like, oh, no, no, I've really done it. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. I never heard that story. Yeah. Yeah, I think that came out later. You know, that was one of, one of his later stories. Um. So one, of, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say one thing I could share, you know, is sort of the the uh, arc of my relationship to psychedelics because I had a pretty intense relationship to psychedelics for several years, but right. but not a lot of years. I mean, you know, in hindsight, it was a relatively brief dalliance, really. Sure. Um, and what ended up happening was after many, many, many wonderful, wonderful experiences on LSD. Mm -hmm. That experience that I described uh, at, at our friend's house, uh, it did two things. One was very positive, I think, which was it opened me up to a lot of thoughts about how reality might work. And, you know, here we are some 50 years later, literally, and that's scary. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, 50 years later, we're, we're hearing these quantum scientists, uh, the current uh, crop of physicists, talking about the multiverse as a real thing potentially. Right. And, uh, you know, what I believed then and believe to this day is that I have experienced the multiverse in that, sure. in that thing with the rotoscope where I, there were all these different realities, you know, so that was kind of cool. But that experience also put a lot of fear into me and it put a lot of fear into me as to, you know, 
where I might go on LSD or a psychedelic and whether or not I could get back. Mm -hmm. um, I had well, a lot then of, that's an interesting question is where is back? Well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I, my belief, and I don't know, it's right. I don't know that it's right. All I can say is it's, it's my belief. And uh, my belief is, and was, uh, that if there were all those different realities, you know, you read about these people that, uh, took acid and never came back. Right. Um, my thought became that at that juncture, they chose the wrong reality. Mm. And so their mind and, and connection to reality was in this, this world over here, but their body was still in this world here. And so there's this massive disconnect and nobody here understands what they're thinking about because their mind is in this other world, this other dimension, this other astral plane. Um, so my fear was that I would pick the wrong world and then I would come back and I would be one of those. But then the question is, is that person whose mind is all the way over there, mm -hmm. are they bothered by that? I guess that's up to the individual. I've known people that were pretty uh, permanently in hell. Okay, so, okay, right. So we're talking to people who are struggling. Because I'm just wondering if, I mean, I guess, you know, it's possible that the body appears one way. But then, you know, the person's experience is maybe far, far away. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I've had difficult times, too, trying to parse out reality as well. You know, looking through the own filters of my own mind and trying to um, kind of clean up the bullshit that get, got in the way of clear seeing. Well, that's actually, know. yeah, that's actually what I was about to get to was that uh, after that switch happened, I started being a little fearful around mm -hmm my psychedelics. And that changed the flavor of the experience. And it kind of changed it um, globally. Right. For me. I was no longer the innocent that I had been previously. Right. I had a sense that this experience could betray me. Um, right. And I didn't have a sense at that time, I think I do now. But at that time, I didn't have any sense that I was maybe betraying myself. Um, you know, not intentionally, but but still, that was the end result because uh, <clears throat> a while after that experience that I described, my next bad trip, and this is the one that kind of stuck a fork in psychedelics for me, mm -hmm. uh, I went to see the Grateful Dead and the NERPS uh, at the Berkeley Community Theater. And I'm sitting there. I had gone with a friend. We were supposed to sit together. He went to go find some other friends and say hi to them and was going to come back, and he never came back. And then the couple sitting in front of me had turned around and said, here, have some orange sunshine. Hmm. So right out of the loop, it was orange sunshine, which was which had been the, 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 the type of acid that had caused that previous experience that I had some trepidation about. So I very cautiously took a quarter hit. About 20 minutes later, I wasn't feeling anything. And it was the dead. I wanted to be high. You know, so I, right. I took another quarter hit. And the NERPs were ending their set. I still wasn't feeling anything. So I popped the other half. And about 30 seconds after I popped the other half, the first quarter hit. Right. I, was like, I was like, uh oh. <laughs> and next thing I knew, all of the ingredients started rolling forward. And I realized I was about to have a huge. And I did not feel safe for all mm -hmm. the history that I'd had of being at concerts and having a wonderful time on acid. At this point, having had a bad trip or what I thought was a bad trip, I wasn't feeling safe about having that experience. And I actually, uh, I went and found an usher with a ponytail down to his butt and wire rim glasses. And I figured he was safe to talk to. And I said, I've just taken way too much LSD and I can't be here. Can you help me? Right. And he said, yeah, sure. And he actually took me out of the theater, walked me out of the theater and around the, around the corner where Herrick Hospital was right there, and they had a psych ward that was prepared for the Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they invited me in, and they, and they gave me a, a, a nice, comfortable bed in a darkened room and said, just chill out here for a while. And, and it really did help. But um, what I was going to talk about was when I started realizing that the trip was going not where I wanted it to go, Mm -hmm. was, was as I was coming on heavy to the acid, 
the experience that I started to have was that all of the people at the Berkeley Community Theater, all of them, were suddenly talking about me. And they oh, yeah, that's the worst. And they were and they were stealing glances at me and then going, <laughs> you know, and I was convinced this was real. And what I realize now, you know, with a lot of hindsight and a lot of years in between, is that was me. That was a reflection of me and where I was holding myself as ew, eh, ew, eh, bad thing, not lovable, mm -hmm. uh, damaged, whatever, whatever the story is, you know, and. Um, you actually reminded me of a story just now that I hadn't thought about in years. Yeah. Um, I was at, I went to University of Oregon in the, in the 90s, and I was at the Willamette Valley Folk Festival. You know, they had um, the college through this folk festival in the grass, and it was nice. And I had seen, you know, I got to see Peter Rowan there, and I got to see um, Ben Harper before he was famous there, a bunch of great acts. And I remember sitting there really, really high, and like, you know, maybe six feet behind me was like, like an older kid. You know, he was like older and he was cooler. And like, we had had a couple of classes together and I sort of thought that he was cool. Um, and I could hear him talking about how shitty I was and how terrible. And, um, and it was like really bothering me. It was really bumming me out that this guy would be like, why would he care? Like, why would he do this? You know, to be telling his, you know, his hot girlfriend, what a, what a, what a schmuck I was. And I think, I saw him a couple of days later on campus. And I was like, hey, man, like, you know, if I ever did anything to like offend you or anything like that, like, I'm really sorry. And he was like, what are you talking about? You know, he oh, wasn't so you, doing it. He so wasn't doing protect, it at all. You yeah, projected he, the whole thing. Yeah, he was just living his life. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> the, same, that's the same thing, you know. Yeah. And, and I, I as, a, as, a, as a human, and I don't know how much psychedelics did or didn't have to do with this, but, you know, I grew up with a sense that I could really read people. Mm -hmm. and 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 a lot of times it's actually true i'm pretty good at reading people you know but right. but it also gets me in a lot of trouble because i don't always know if i'm really reading somebody and that's really what's happening right or if i'm projecting my own fears my own stuff onto them yeah you know so yeah that's why i really have started to work have you ever read the book pronoia <laughs> So there's a book called Chronoia by a Marin guy, Rob Bresney, you know, the astrologer, mm. um, you know, ponytail guy, writes, writes New Age astrology. Um, and so you, you're familiar with the term pronoia? I mean, I'm assuming it's the opposite of paranoia. Or yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the unshakable belief that the universe is conspiring to shower you with blessings. Yes, please. I want that. <laughs> you know, the, those people who are, um, you know, going through your trash at night. They're talent scouts. Okay. And so when I discovered this book and it, you know, this sort of philosophy, and I just have, you know, started to use it. That like, unless it's sort of like an innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. Unless somebody comes right out and tells me that they hate me, I'm just going to assume we're good. That's a very good, healthy place to be. And I, I, uh, I'm working on nurturing that in myself, but I'm yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah far out and so like back in those days like when did you start playing when did you start playing guitar oh god i was like nine okay something like that you know the, the beatles happened and uh i i was already i think i was already just you know fussing with it a little bit i think i was playing like oh sinner man and some of those old folk songs right when i was when i was a kid i was in the san francisco boys chorus and we used to have music summer camp uh, for a full month at a, at a uh, Boy Scout camp every year. And I met this guy at, at uh, music camp. And this was before the hate or any of that stuff had happened. And he had a ponytail mm -hmm. and he played folk guitar. And I, I, I wanted to be around him. So I started learning guitar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and shortly thereafter, the Beatles came out on Ed Sullivan. And I right. saw that. And I was like, I want to be that. <laughs> I want to do that right there. That's what I want to do. Right. And, and from that moment, I kind of, I knew what I was going to be doing with my life. You know? <laughs> right. And then, you know, tell me about when that flow state started to happen. Like you, you described that, you know, you get into this deeply connected 
space, when did that start to become a reality? Was there a moment when things like clicked and you're like, okay, it's working, I am that? It was never an intention. So kind of hard to say. I think probably what happened was it was happening of its own accord long before I ever took note or even had the uh, perspective to be able to take note. You know, when I was a little kid, it, it, it gave me an avenue to be me. It gave mm -hmm. me an avenue to be on my own, to, to connect to my creativity, to have an identity. Um, right. I don't know that I really noticed the other thing until probably until I was uh, a preteen or an early teen and had been experimenting with mm -hmm. psychoactive stuff. Um, because certainly when I was, you know, when I was high, when I was being given a peek through that door or window or whatever, uh, I noticed and I noticed the difference. I mean, my bands that I was in when I was a teen, uh, when we would jam, it would definitely go to some other place if we were high, you know, and I, and I noticed that I, I, I noticed the flow of that. Um, and in fact, interestingly, you know, I, I, I had mentioned earlier that I had 16 years clean and sober. Right. And I was still super, super connected to music during that time. And I had a lot of joy and a lot of really good emotional experiences with music. But um, I will say that once I started smoking pot again, what I noticed, and again, you know, this is something I'm, I'm very hungry to recreate without any substance, and I do think it's possible. But what I noticed is that the, that the pot or a little bit of psychedelics or whatever seems to open up, I don't know if they're neural pathways or whatever, but I access some different part of my creativity some more flowing part of my creativity where the instincts and intuition kick in and the I'm gonna goes away. Oh, I'm gonna, that's an interesting demon. <laughs> this is what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna play this lick because it's supposed to have this effect or that dude's playing fancy and I better play fancy too to keep up with him or the audience won't think I'm good or all those silly conversations. You know, my, my ex-wife used to say something that just used to drive me up the wall. Uh, but she was right, which is honey. The reality is most music fans out there don't really understand the music. They, they understand the experience, but they don't understand the music. And so if you play high up the neck and fast, you're good. And if you don't play high up the neck and you don't play fast and complicated, you're not very good. And that's always been a real bugaboo for me because my real connection and passion around music is around emotional connection, melody, and simplicity and ability to connect. You know, that is so funny. I hear, I was talking to Gil Landry, who was on the podcast earlier. He played with Old Crow for a while and solo, solo now. And he's a brilliant songwriter. And uh -huh. he's got this sort of dark broodiness to him. And it's kind of very slow and full of pathos. But the guy can pick. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was talking to him about like how impressed I was by his picking and he was like man that's the easy stuff it's like i want i just want to like you know be evocative like i just want to play a song that you can like feel that feels like true in people's bones yeah yeah that's what i'm after too you know and, and that's what i'm after in terms of like if i'm so like jamming is an interesting thing you know the concept of jamming that that term is uh i think it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people probably Mm -hmm. for, for me, there are a lot of bands out there that call themselves jam bands. And to me, my interpretation, what I hear when I listen to them, is I'll hear the band chugging along, kind of not doing anything different, just playing the same thing over and over and over again, and giving a guitar player or a keyboard player or a sax player or whatever uh, a platform 
to masturbate forever. Okay. And I, that, that holds no appeal for me. I mean, you know, if that's your thing, great, but that holds no appeal for me. For me, jamming is defined by something very different, which is that it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I might be in the lead guitar chair for the moment, but it's not all about me. I'm going to, I want to toss something out there. I want to toss the ball out there and I want somebody to hit it back to me or to catch it and juggle it for a second and toss it to somebody else. I want to hear a musical idea, a rhythmic motif, mm -hmm. uh, uh, some kind of a theme and, and have a conversation around that. I, I want to play a responsive lick and then have the keyboard player go, oh, I heard that. Let me jump on that train and then the bass player will support that. And it creates this wonderful interactive uh, exciting experience in the moment. And to me, that's right. what real jamming is. Right, as opposed, because otherwise what you're talking about is basically a Sunday afternoon bluegrass circle. I suppose, you know? yeah, but, but except without the, uh, with bluegrass, much the same as like in blues or country, mm -hmm. uh, the solo may not be very conversational, mm -hmm. but it also has um, a definite limit. You know, it's an eight right. bar or 16 yes. bar and then done and we're back to the song. Right, or you're, on to, on, or you're on to the next guy. Or, right, well, and, then, and, and eventually back to the song, yeah. yeah. But, but uh, you know, the, what I'm talking about is when, you know, one person plays for 15 or 20 minutes. It's yeah. like, ugh, enough already. <laughs> I got it, you know, yeah, yeah. Pro, I mean, pros and cons to all of it. But, um, I mean, when... The, when I first started listening, and, and, and you even more so, when I first started listening to The Grateful Dead, there, the word jam band didn't really exist. Right. You know, it was like, you know, the, these things sort of popped up later and um, I guess took on a myriad of different forms. Well, you know, the, it, it's interesting to me to think about the early bands that were in the hate that I was seeing because right. most of them jammed on some level to some degree but the jams were of really different flavors you know like one of my very very favorite bands from that era was quicksilver messenger service right and they certainly had long extended jams sure and and, and i loved what they did but what the grateful dead was up to was pretty singular yeah all the other bands that were jamming, they were stretching songs, they were being creative in the moment, but it kind of always stayed earthbound. It kind of always stayed part of the structure on some level of the song. Right. As opposed to what I felt the Grateful Dead were doing, especially when they would, when those magic nights would happen where everything was firing on all cylinders. They would, you know, they, it, to me, the Grateful Dead have always been, to me, the epitome of the concept of jazz, but with different languaging. Right. You know, the song is the head in jazz, and then they would go and they would improvise, and all bets were off, and they would go wherever they would end up. Right. And it was conversational, and it was thoughtful, and it was interactive, and it was really interesting, and it went to places that were unexpected, and eventually they'd get back to the song or not. And that was pretty unique to them. I mean, it was always so delightful to me when I'd forget what the song was. And then they'd come back and remind me. To be like, right, oh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. okay. And there was also that sense of coming back to earth. And it's like, oh, okay, I'm safe. Yeah, <laughs> I made yeah exactly. It, made it back to the end of the song. Home again, home again. Yeah. And so you have talked, we haven't talked much about how the 12 steps, you know, you, you started talking about that. Um, you know, how has that evolved your spirituality and your creativity? Good question. Um, I'm perfectly comfortable talking about it. And if I'm honest, I don't know that I'm comfortable with my answer, but I'm okay giving it. Okay. Uh, which is, I got, I, I, in the 80s, I went down the rabbit hole pretty good of uh, quite a bit of alcohol and cocaine okay. and was living the 
uh, debauched lifestyle of a rock star, but on a much more local level. You know, I was in a uh, locally popular band. I wasn't making a lot of money. I wasn't on tour, but but I had the ego strokes of being in that locally popular band, and I was following the lead of you know my heroes like Keith Richards, <laughs> and uh, you know, so it was all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I wasn't being very conscious at all. Even though I'd been introduced to consciousness as a teen around mm -hmm. LSD, right. I had long since walked away from psychedelics, and 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 I was in a pretty much of an ego place around my music. And uh, I got sober in '84 um, at 29 years of age, and uh, got. I had the interesting experience of having my bottom. I was going to some meetings because I was scared. I, I realized I had some work to do or, you know, I needed to do something to help myself. Right. And uh, I had my personal bottom, which I won't go into, but it was enough to really shake me at my core. Sure. And I had the very interesting and kind of unusual experience of having my compulsion to drink and use just lifted. How did that, and now how did that happen? Because I actually got a question. I get that question of like how to quit. You know, people who are interested in like, can psychedelics help me quit quit other drugs, or or how does how does one quit, or what is that like? And yeah, I don't have any. I I don't think anybody has an answer for that, really. I mean, it's it's unique to the individual. Right. For for me personally, I, I think the idea, at least in the twelve step programs, the idea is that you have some sort of a life experience which right. shakes you to your core and makes you able and willing to take the scary step into doing something radically different with your life that you're not at all sure you're ready to do. Right. And with the 12 step groups, what you have is you have support to do that, uh, yeah. to help you make that choice and that decision. For me, I had that compulsion lifted. And so for better or for worse, I just stopped and I actually didn't do the 12 step thing. Mm. I had, I had been going, which familiarized me with the idea but once I stopped using, I, I just stopped using. So I didn't go to meetings. Right. So okay. many years later, uh, I was in the middle of a big breakup with my girlfriend. Uh, I was feeling pretty beat up by life. And I was invited to go on a vacation by some AA friends, uh, a sober vacation that AA was hosting. And I was invited to go on this vacation as part of the band. And I wasn't, I wasn't intending to do any 12 step work. I was going for the vacation and the, and the music and the money. Right. Um, actually I, there wasn't money. It was in, it was in exchange for the vacation in a room there. Anyway. Um, uh, when I got down there, much to my surprise, I found myself being pretty inspired by all the 12 step stuff. Right. Next thing I knew I found, I found that I'd found a sponsor and I started working my steps. Right. And at the end of that vacation, I checked my answering machine and there was a message from the Grateful Dead's management and asking me if I would be interested in coming up to the Bay Area and playing with the guys from the Grateful Dead. And uh, needless to say, I was like, yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. I had no expectation of getting the gig. I just thought, what a cool experience I'm about to go have. Uh, and then I wound up getting the gig and that's when the other ones happened. And I got up to my fourth step, which is the big inventory. And it's, you know, what many people consider the scariest part of doing the 12 steps. And I made really good headway into the fourth step and then got so sucked into world tour land with the other ones and finally achieving my dream of being in a big band. I abandoned the whole thing. I walked away from it mm. and, and, and gave myself fully to the experience of being the other ones, which then led to rat dog. And I continued to give myself fully to that. Um, so I, I didn't, I, I never went beyond the fourth step. Uh, right. And then a few years ago, um, you know, the quick aside would be that I continued to struggle emotionally and spiritually. Sure. Um, through all those years, I, I did, I hadn't done anything to, to address my emotional and spiritual stuff. Sure. Um, so a few years ago when my girlfriend and I split up, I was really devastated. 
you know, I, I had lost my marriage. I had lost Rat Dog. I had survived cancer. Uh, and I had found this gal and I was really in love with her. And then my old demons cropped up, you know, and I know what my, I know what was going on on my side of the street. I mean, it takes two, but I know what was going on on my side of the street. I know what my contributions were to the end of it all. And she turned me on to adult children of alcoholics in dysfunctional families, which is a 12 step group that's not about substance abuse. It's about dealing with how we were raised and the very deep core issues that right. come from that. Uh, and so for the last three plus years, uh, I've been very involved in, in that 12 step program and doing a lot of the work. I'm actually on my fourth step again in this program. Um, right I, I hope I'm on there. You hope you're on there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Weird 12 step joke. I don't know. You know how they say, cause you know, I've done 12 step work too. And you know, they say you can't put yourself on other people's resentment lists you know, to get amends, you know, you can't, you can't put, you can't tell other people that they need to apologize to you. Oh, well, that's certainly true. Yeah. And I'm not even sure in some instances, you know, like, like my ex-girlfriend, I, I don't really know why. Um, for quite a while, we were doing a very good job of being friends right. post, post breakup. And then all of a sudden she just fell off the radar and I, I tried to reach out to her and realized that she'd blocked my phone and my texting and I have no idea what happened. And, Oh, far out. Okay, well, moving right along. <laughs> so I guess we get it. They, they talk, the thing that's really interesting, and I think that um, here's a neat place where, uh, you know, psychedelics and the 12 step over, overlap is where they talk about the idea of the living amends. Whereas like there's some people that you can't like sit down and be like, hey, I'm sorry, I fucked you over or whatever it is. And the idea is to just like, well, I'm just going to be better. You know, because yeah. maybe the person blocked you or maybe they're dead or maybe it's just like, you know, maybe they're just they're just gone or it would hurt them too much to even talk to you. You know, yep. so you just kind of decide to be better. And it reminds me a lot of like the times when, you know, they kind of the choose your own reality portion of the psychedelic experience, you know, talks about the consequences of how we treat one another and how our actions, you know, really have consequences and how we have a choice. Uh, not just what reality we inhabit, but who's the guy who's doing the inhabiting. You know, and I think that sort of is, is what makes some, some of the difference. And so those living, like, I really like the idea of the living events. Yeah. Yeah. I like that too. I, uh, yeah. I mean, cause like, I don't know that, you know, I, I definitely feel that there are amends to be made in some of my past relationships and some of those people, like you say, wouldn't be, wouldn't be comfortable being contacted or maybe I don't even have the ability to contact them at this point, but right. I can be a better me and mm -hmm. that's bringing better energy to the planet. And in that sense, you know, it's a healing of sorts. It's a healing of sorts. Yeah. So we've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything that was sort of has been on the tip of your tongue that we missed? Um, <clears throat> well, only, you know, I mean, I don't know how, you know, I, I don't have much to hide in my life, really. Uh, it's never mm -hmm. been my thing. Um, so what I guess I would say is, uh, as far as my own relationship to psychedelics and what all that's about, you know, um, I am looking forward to taking the risk or taking the deep mm -hmm. dive of doing some work with you, uh, with psychedelics, mm -hmm. um, because um, I feel like I've got a lot of stuck energy. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of stuck ways of being. And I'm in a time of my life when I really want to shake that stuff up. And it's scary to me to shake it up. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, if there's clear water, am I about to put a bunch of really scary mud into it, you know, before getting to the other side? And am I, am I strong enough? Am I courageous enough to, to swim through that mud and, and to get to the clear water, you know? I don't know. I'm, I'm fearful, but I also know that at my age and at this chapter of my life, um, I feel like it's my life's mission. I feel like it's time. I feel like I want to be more open to better, stronger, more loving relationships than I have been. And, yeah. uh, so yeah, I need to take the deep dive. 
Well, so if we were going to just like throw that up against a fourth step, it's like, what, what's the fear about? Just from um, like that simple, from that simple perspective. Getting lost, you know, like, like, yeah. like I say, you know, uh, somehow picking the wrong reality to come back to or that somehow, and I know there's not much reality to this observation even, but somehow feeling that I, I wouldn't be able to handle what I experience. Right. And I'm not even sure what that means. Totally. And then I guess my other question, because, you know, the 12 steps have a deep spiritual aspect to them, mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, how much of that are, are you even in charge of and how much is, is like God in charge of? Well, yes. And of course, one of the areas uh, not uncommon from what I gather around, around people doing 12 steps, uh, one of the areas I struggle with is that God or higher power thing. And do I believe in it? And mm. And if I do believe in a higher power, which I do, but I call it the universe, sure. or the divine, then it's difficult for me to take something like the universe or the divine that I don't think of as a being. What do you think and, of it as? Because that's one of the cool things about... An, an energy, a force, uh, a, a thing at the center of all things, but not something that has, that thinks or has a personality or an opinion. Huh. Uh, and so when I read things like, you know, follow God's guidance or God's plan for you. And then mm -hmm. that feels like something a person would have guiding somebody or planning something. Right. And, and so I have, like a lot of us in 12 steps, especially a lot of us newer to 12 steps, I have some diff, I want to connect to my higher power. I believe that there is a power greater than me. Giving you know that I power, the ability to guide me or giving myself permission. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. Right. You know, that's really interesting that you said like God wouldn't have a personality or the universe doesn't have a personality because it makes me think of the Vaishnavas, like the Hare Krishnas, because, you know, they worship Krishna. And the idea of Krishna is that he's the supreme personality. Right. But he's a, but he's a he just like yes. God is a he in a throne somewhere with a white. I don't I'm not agree. trying to convert. I'm not trying to convert you to Krishna right now. I'm just. No, I know to, that. No, I know that. I'm just trying to, but I just think it's. Not being able to relate to a religion, to a deity yeah. of any kind. Like to me, I don't, I don't judge other people that believe in deities, but I'm, like I'm a Buddhist, or at least I identify with a lot of Buddhist practice, but I have a hard time with Tibetan Buddhism because of all the deities and demons and all that part of it. Sure. Yeah, interesting. But it is also so interesting that, the, the, that they still, the Buddhists, they still have like the three jewels. You know, there's this, I really like the idea of like taking refuge. It's like there's like, like a surrender is sort of built into the system. Is it the Buddha and the Dharma? Because I guess the universe is kind of like the Dharma. It's just sort of this way. It's just sort of this energy that flows in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like how, and perhaps it's even this flow that's going through the music. It's like, you know, how do we bow to that? I mean, or whatever refuge, like whatever the, physical expression of taking refuge looks like yeah maybe it's picking up a guitar i don't know i mean it, it may be that the flow since mm -hmm. really that term that word has always been really big for me yeah. on some level uh and maybe that's what it really is maybe the higher power that i need to embrace or can embrace mm -hmm. is what i refer to as the flow yeah. And so maybe, you know, if there's a question about, uh, if there's a question about God's plan for me, if I, if I balk at that way of referring to it, maybe the real deal is God's plan for me means being in the flow. Mm. And so, and so my way of being healed in all of this would be to, to understand and connect to being able to get when I'm in the flow and to be able right. to get back in the flow when I'm not. Right. I like that, you know, because if I think about, you know, what is what is God's will for me? And if the idea, because I worry, it's like, oh, well, what if it means that, you know, I have to eat at Denny's or something, you know, you know something, <laughs> <laughs> this sort, of, sort of like weird details. Whereas it's like, I can get behind more like, oh, God's plan for me is to be in the flow. Like, that's what he wants for me. Yes. He, she, it, you know, it's like, it's, it's interesting. Cause I do, 
do a lot of practices with feminine deities. Nice. And it treats me really well. Um, they treat me really well. Um, like a mother, you know, sometimes, nice. which is, which is pleasant. Um, but, um, yeah, surrendering to the flow. Yeah. And doing that as sort of an expression. Uh, and then what happens is kind of like, that doesn't just, it, it puts me in the, rea then I'm kind of not cho just choosing a reality. I'm kind of creating it too. Just uh, as, as I flow through my life, you know, perhaps like, I mean, because you're a creator, like at the end, like that's your profession is to create. And so like kind of getting into a flow state to create flow states for others. Yeah, well, one of the things I've been thinking about, because truthfully, I'm, I, I'm not doing the kind of touring I was with Rat Dog, you know, I'm not making the kind of money I was on the road, which makes me less desirous of living in SUVs and cheap motels, uh, you know, sure. as I get older, it's kind of like, yeah, I'd rather be home and going on hikes and visiting my friends and playing locally, you know. Um, so one of the things that's crossed my mind is, well, if I need to re-examine kind of what it is that I'm doing with my music, because I'm pretty clear that music is why I'm here. Uh, but maybe this chapter of me and this chapter of music around me is about uh, finding a way to help others with music, to heal with music, to heal myself too, but but to heal other people, you know, to find a modality with with what I can do with my gifts of music and creativity that maybe helps all of us get in the flow as opposed to thinking in terms of a music career and how many people I draw and mm -hmm. whether or not I have a big Facebook presence and crap like that, you know? Well, I mean, I got to tell you, you healed me with music. Well, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but really like literally like, you know, working with you for the, I mean, there's no reason that anybody who's watching would know but, you know, you made a Facebook post. It was like, hey, I'm giving guitar lessons. And I was like, hey, the famous guitarist who lives down the road is giving guitar lessons. I should probably go take some. Um, but then I decided to get married. And it was like, oh, well, I should like play a song. And we found this really cute band. Hey, Johnny Provo, the one Eye Jacks in, because um, we, we got married in Rhode Island. And you type Grateful Dead cover band into Rhode Island and there's like four shitty bar bands. Sorry, guys. And then like this one band that had like a stand up bass and a banjo and they had this like nice acoustic vibe. And I was like, oh, that's like a summer outdoor band. Like that's, that's the one I want. And they were super cool about, oh yeah, of course you can sit in and play how sweet it is. And just kind of working with you on that. I mean, first of all, like opening up my voice was like terror, you know, it was like emotional. You know, sort of like, you know, kind of standing, thinking, I don't know how you guys do it. I don't know how you guys like stand on stage and just bear your soul and like sing to the world because it was terrifying and painful for a while. And you just hung out. You're like, it's okay. You could freak out for a while. And, and we got there and it was, it was freaking amazing. And was like, you know, a pivotal moment of like that whole ceremony, like that whole like, ceremony. yeah, that was, it was huge. So, I mean, you have that capacity, no doubt. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of people through the years have told me that they, that they perceive me <clears throat> as a healer. Mm -hmm. um, that's always been difficult for me, but, but I'm attracted to the idea. Right. Um, and, I've, and I've always sort of believed in that, other, that, little, that, that, that tired little axiom that I think is true, which is, you know, give a healing, get a healing. Uh, you right. know, so, so to help others, I think would also, you know, since my part of my mission is to heal my own self, I think that would also heal me. Chris Nance says that you healed him too many times. Mm. Do you know Chris Nance? Or yeah, is he just a, yeah. no, you guys I, are pals? We actually, I worked on a record that he did a few years ago that was really a lot of fun. Oh, right on. Yeah. yeah. Um, very, very cool. Anybody else who's listening been healed by Mark? <laughs> While, while we're at it, See. well, you know, it's my, I'll give you a little aside. There is, um, yeah. I used to always feel like what I was doing musically was very selfish. Mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily beat myself up about it, but my sense was, you know, I do this for me, and how lucky am I that I get to run around on stages, play music, get paid for that, have a lot of free time, blah 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 blah, whatever that was. 
Right. And on some level, subconsciously, I think I judged myself a little bit as being frivolous and selfish. Mm. And my ex-wife was the one who said, "Hun, sure, you get all those lovely bennies. But don't ever forget that when you go to Buffalo, New York in the wintertime, and those streets are coated in snow, and those windows are boarded up, and those people got nowhere to go and nothing to do, and they're having a depressing, fucking, long, cold winter. Yeah. You guys show up and you bring the rainbows, and they need the fucking rainbows. And it made me realize, wow, I didn't realize that I'm gifting people by doing the very thing that just feels like it's all for me. I'm right. actually bringing a gift. Yeah. I mean, you would think or otherwise people wouldn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I knew that they would, they enjoyed it, but I never thought of it as, as, you know, really helping them in terms of a soul connection or, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I mean, that is really like, I mean, talk about the flow. I mean, that's where a lot of us kind of learn how to connect to something deeper. And learn that we have, you know, we connect to something deeper. We we get information or wisdom that we wouldn't ordinarily get. Um, you know, we sort of have access to agency to change our lives in ways that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise. And that's like high or not. I mean, I've been to plenty of shows sober, dancing my ass off and have things change. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really, uh, really amazing. Yeah, I feel very, very blessed that I've been able to do what I've been able to do for pretty much all my life. I mean, I started doing this when I was 19. I'm 65 years old now, and I have never stopped. So mm -hmm. so right on. Are you working on any projects right now? Are you working on any? Yeah, I'm, I'm finishing up my second record. Um, oh. um, I actually just produced uh, a record for Lauren Murphy um, that's in the process of being mixed. I'm not doing the mixes. Uh, Who's that? Laura Murphy was uh, wife to Judge Murphy from Zero, uh, okay. and Judge and she had the band Lansdale Station around here, and then she was also doing her own solo stuff before uh, a couple of years ago, moving down to, of all places, Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've also been co-producing uh, my co-writing partner, Deb Gravian's uh, second record with her band, The Sound Field. Okay. Uh, and I'm teaching. And, uh, you know, when all of this goes away, this COVID thing that makes us not be able to play in venues and whatnot, um, I have intention uh, to get my music back active, playing right. out with my music. And I'm, and I'm looking. I mean, frankly, if anybody's watching that has something interesting going on musically, um, I'm definitely looking for what's next. I don't know what it looks like yet. Right on. Well, that is, um, that's super cool. And it's kind of super cool to see that you're kind of working with female musicians for whatever reason, you know, because the jam band scene, you know, is, it's got sometimes got kind of a boys club vibe to it. Yeah. Haley Jane. I'll, I'll just toss that out there for a gal that I recently did uh, a set with a, a night with at Terrapin and mm -hmm. she's coming up kind of in the, in our jam band scene. Mm hmm. And as a female, it brings a lot to the party. Right. Do you think she wants to be on the podcast? Maybe. I don't really know. I don't know what her background is with psychedelics or anything like that. Right. You got to make sure she gets super high. <laughs> well, or at, at least some point. <laughs> has some familiarity and maybe right. a, a positive relationship to it on some level. I don't know. Right. Well, cool. And then how do people find you? Um, I suck. Um, my, my, I, I my, com. <laughs> my, my PR world, uh, you know, my ex-wife used to do my PR and I tried for a while after we split and I'm just not great at that kind of stuff. So, you know, I have a website, I have a mailing list on the website. I'd love for you to sign up for the mailing list. I don't send out much. I mean, literally like three or four emails a year. Um, it's not enough. It's not enough, but that's, that's about what I'm up to. And then I've got, uh, <laughs> right. I've got my Facebook page, my, my personal page, which uh, gets a fair amount of interaction, mm -hmm. and my pro page, which I should spend more time with and don't. Um, and that's kind of it, you know. I, I, uh, I tend to publicize my solo gigs and stuff more. 
uh, and let the bands that hire me as a sideman take care of their own PR so I don't get too sucked into the world of all I do is PR and all of a sudden I'm not playing music anymore. Totally. Um, that's, that's the main reason I don't have more uh, accessible and visible promotional facets to my thing. Sure. Is when I was doing that, when I was doing a lot more of that actively, I ended up hating it. And I ended up hating my music because my music became about marketing and not about music and not about feeling. Yeah. And, you know, that's not what I want from my music. Totally. Um, you're echoing the sentiments that um, basically everybody, all of you, everybody says. Mm. It's, t it's really interesting. Well, it's it's kind of really interesting because it used to be, it seemed like the record labels would take care of that, but then also they would take all the money too. Well, yeah, I mean, there is some truth to that. You know, I, I have a, a, a definite love-hate relationship with thinking back to the old model of the music business because mm -hmm. you're right, they took way too much of the money. And there are pluses and minuses to what I'm about to bring up. But for me, in hindsight, I think mostly it's pluses. We used to have gatekeepers. Right. And so, you know, for better or for worse, there was somebody determining whether or not something was good enough to bother putting out. Mm. And now, you know, I don't tend to think hierarchically. It's not really one of my favorite places to be. But what I notice is that now that it's become really literally an everyman game, with everybody having garage band on their computers and, you know, anybody from a seven year old kid to a 70 year old man being able to make and release music. Yes. There yeah, I are. just, I just bought this thing. I'm not sure what that is. It's but... an $89 sampler and sequencer. Oh, that's funny. That's great. All right. It's just yeah. like it doesn't even have a case. You have to buy the case extra. See but... that. And that's so funny because you know, that, that, that exemplifies one of the things that uh, has happened. Mm -hmm. Which is that back in the day with the labels, you know, when you were going to make a record, if the labels picked you up to make a record, you were going to be in a real studio with mm -hmm. engineers that were studied and really understood the craft of recording and the depth of that. And now in the Everyman game, it's great that everybody can make music. That's wonderful. I love that openness. Mm -hmm. But there's a big difference between making a record in a beautiful studio with really skilled engineers and making a record in your bedroom on GarageBand. And I think that that difference, the appreciation for that difference, the, diff the appreciation for the real artistry mm -hmm. of classic true studio recordings is kind of going away. Uh, because people are, you know, they're hearing music that's recorded in all different uh means and so the connection to and the passion about audiophile recordings and you know the art of recording and sound and all of that it's getting at least at the very least diluted right um and i, I miss you know and then you know the, the truth is i hate to be judgmental but there's a lot of bands that suck there are that are, that are putting out music now and it's flooding the playing field to where you know, instead of the several hundred albums that would get through from major labels a year, there are tens of thousands of albums being released now. And how do you find the good stuff anymore? How do you wade through the crap and the weekend warrior amateur hour shit to the real artistry and the people that really are bringing something that they're committed to, to the party? Yes. I don't know the answer to that. That's a very good question. Yeah, well, me neither. You know, I'm just... Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to get to the point where it's all about acceptance, you know, and putting one foot in front of the other. Right. And, and uh, you know, because I've been trying to control everything for a long time and that doesn't work very well. Yeah. I mean, shouting it, sh you know, waving, waving your fist at kids with garage band isn't. isn't I'm not interested. In that. Yeah. I, I don't want to. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just observing what's happened, you know, just like Napster, whatever it was, 20 something years ago coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I don't really have a resentment against the guy that brought, a bar, brought Napster out. But by bringing Napster out, this guy essentially uh, took recorded music, which was a viable means of making a living, mm -hmm. and turned it into a hobby um, because there was no way to monetize it anymore. Yeah. You know, the expectation suddenly became that recorded music should be free. And 
I mean, it just is what it is. I don't love it because I, I grew up in a different era when that just wasn't what was happening. You know, uh, I grew up in an era where music was a way to, you know, it was a career. It right. was a way to make, you didn't have to have a day job and do the music on the side. And then maybe if you were one in a million, you might actually break three, break free. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that wasn't it. You know, you, you, there were a lot of people that didn't make it in music for sure. Yes. And it was always a crapshoot. You never had any guarantees of being able to make it in the business. But at least there was the possibility that you could hit and hit big. Mm -hmm. um, and then additionally, there was the possibility you could hit small, but make a meager living forever selling CDs and stuff like that. And sure. Nowadays, it's, it's hard to find people that want to pay for CDs, period. They want to download the shit for free. And then a lot of people in our scene, in the sort of dead connected scene, they revile recorded music. They're, they're, they're all about the live music. And they, right. they don't even want the recordings. They feel they're too controlled or whatever. And for me, that's like saying, I only want sculpture. I don't want painted art. Mm -hmm. It's two different art forms. Why not be able to appreciate both of them? Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't use my CD player much, I must admit. There you go. You know, um, I do like, I mean, I got to tell you, like, just from my own personal buying tastes is these days I kind of like vinyl and I know that's annoying to produce, but there's just sort of, I, I do, you will see me walking out of a concert quite often. Like if they have a, if they have a record, it's like, I often have the record under my arm because there's just something sort of fun about it, you know, and I kind of grew up discovering music through my parents' record collection. Well, and that's, it, some, it and that's something I can learn about. That, that's like a thing is like, I grew up on my parents' record collection and that influenced my music. It was almost like mimetic is that like the music that my parents listened to became the music that I listened to. Yep. And then nowadays, like if there's no artifact for the music, it's just being streamed all the time. It's like that. There's a generate. There's a loss generationally there. Yeah, you know, and there's, no, and there's no roots that way. And mm -hmm. and you know, I mean, to to draw the metaphor, what's a you know a, a tree with a bunch of branches and beautiful flowers is great, but if it doesn't have any roots, it's fucked. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's true with music too. I mean, it's nice to have whatever's new. It's nice to check out the bright shiny object, but. Right. The history and the connection to the history and the, the lineage of where that bright shiny object originated from, you know, and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah, indeed. I mean, these are things I think about more now that I've got a, a, a kid is, you know, what is he going to listen to? How, how is that going to connect us? How are we going to relate? You know, my dad made us listen to uh, like doo -wop, you mm -hmm. know, on, on road trips and like, I don't really love, you know, um, Gary and the Rockets and you know the, the Shondells like it's not my go-to but like but I know those songs like I appreciate them you know he had the 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 cassette you know he had like a box set of cassettes you know um and so it's like how how does that get passed down and, yeah I don't know you anymore because there's I mean the, yeah there's there's that aspect of it there's the sort of whole, whole phone culture where if it's not on your iPhone or your or your Android, you don't know about it and you don't care about it. Right. You know, uh, you were talking about the vinyl thing. One of the things I love about vinyl is it uh, it does it brings some of the specialness back, and also mm -hmm. you know on a on a uh, purely practical level, it sounds better. Right. You know, I mean, I love the sound of a vinyl record. It doesn't, you know, CD may have a broader. Uh, frequency spectrum and it may be quieter and all that kind of stuff but it doesn't sound as good you know, there's a right. there's a warmth and a silkiness and an expansiveness to the sound of vinyl which i don't think you can get any other way maybe tape yeah there's something you know it's it's i, I also like ritual you know so there's something sort of nice about the ritual of bringing it out to yes. displaying the yeah. cover and dropping the needle and Rolling All that the on the album cover. <laughs> mm -hmm. I always used to like the gatefold covers because you could open them up and roll doobies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Um, well, like, thanks for being here. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, you know, I would love for people to check out. I mean, people know who you are. Um, but, you know, I would love for them to get on your mailing list to get those three precious emails a year. 
<laughs> I'm going to ramp that up. I'm sure. I you know, <laughs> if I'm going to get the band back together, I'm going to have to do things that support that happening. Right. Any last thoughts? Um, not really. I mean, you know, I, I will be doing an Indiegogo thing uh, to help me pay for the completion of this record I'm working on. So awesome. If you guys see that come out, I'd love your support. And when the record itself comes out, I'd love for you to buy it. Mm -hmm. I know that, uh, you know, buying CDs is kind of an anachronism these days, but uh, I would right. love your support there and I'd love to get the music out to everybody. So, and um, I'm still teaching, you know, so if anybody's looking to do lessons, um, you can reach me either via the website or which is uh or uh, via one of my Facebook pages. You can just message me and uh, we can talk about doing it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, also, thank you to Deadhead Land uh, for Brian. hosting us. Brian, thank you so much. You can donate to the Deadhead Land Patreon. Um, you can also donate to the um, TAM Integration Patreon um, to support the podcast or go to tamintegration.com slash donate or, you know, reach out for coaching. You know, if you if you need to talk about these sorts of topics, uh, we're here for you. Um, Mark, you're the best, man. So much love. Really appreciate it. I right don't, brother. Come in, baby.